so we are back once again now if y'all watched my last video y'all know i did the brief history of the beatles and i learned a lot watching that video learning some things i didn't know about them and now today i bring to you we're gonna be checking out the brief history of queen another group that i love i love their music i mean look they really don't need an introduction because we know queen <laughs> we know how legendary they uh, they are but uh before we get to the video be sure to like the video subscribe to the channel and uh leave a comment down below you know let me think uh let me know what you think about the video but so far let's go ahead and dive straight into this and let's check out the brief history of queen Imperial College, London, 1968. Brian May and Tim Staffel, two longtime friends and students at the college who had previously played in a band together, decide to start a new band. May would play guitar and Staffel would play bass and sing. They placed an ad for a, quote, Mitch Mitchell slash Ginger Baker type drummer and another Imperial College student named Roger Taylor auditioned and got the job. They named the band smile and soon began playing gigs all over town soon they got the attention of the american record label mercury records who signed them in 1969 they recorded three songs at trident studios in june meanwhile staffel's friend freddie bulsara who had been in various bands had probably become smile's biggest fan he was at all their shows and kind of like an unofficial fourth member however staffel didn't like the direction smile was going and left the band to form a new one called Humpy Bong. Brian May and Roger Taylor still wanted to perform their songs, but they needed a new lead singer. Enter Freddie Bulsara, who enthusiastically took Staffel's spot. Bulsara convinced them to change the band's name to Queen. The next year, he would change his own name to Freddie Mercury. Freddie sang beautifully, but wasn't... I thought his real name was Freddie Mercury. I promise y'all, this whole time, I thought his real name was Freddie Mercury. Wow. Wow. Big on playing instruments, so Queen would need a bassist. The band went through three before John Deacon ended up joining the band, who not only excelled at bass, but also at tinkering around with electronics. After that, Queen practiced relentlessly. As a four-piece, they played their first show on July 2nd, 1971 at Surrey College. By that point, they had already recorded a four-song demo, but had no luck attracting record labels with it. Using his graphic design skills, Mercury designed a logo for the band based on the zodiac signs of its members. Those two lions represent Deacon and Taylor, both Leo. The crab represents May, who is Cancer, and the two fairies represent Mercury, who is Virgo. In 1972, the band got their first break thanks to producers John Anthony and Roy Thomas Baker. They got them a management deal under Neptune Productions to try to help them get a record label. One of the biggest perks was access to Trident Studios, one of the best recording studios in the world at the time. The band got lots of quality time learning how to produce magnificent recordings in those studios and recorded quite a few songs with Anthony and Baker. The next oh, year, right. Neptune Productions got them a contract with both Trident and EMI Records. On July 13th, 1973, EMI released Queen's self-titled debut studio album. Elektra Records released it in the United States. It was a mix of heavy metal and progressive rock, and the few critics who reviewed it generally loved it. However, the lead single, Keep Yourself Alive, didn't do well, and the album failed to get much mainstream success. In November, Queen went on their first major tour to support the band's Mott the Hoople. After that tour, the band went right right back to Trident Studios to finish recording songs for their second studio album. EMI and Elektra both released those songs as the album Queen 2 on March 8th, 1974. The album ultimately also didn't do that well, but the cover of the album first featured this iconic picture of the band, taken by Mick Rock. Also, the album featured the band's first true hit song in the UK, Seven Seas of Rye. Why was the song a hit? 
hit? Well, mostly because back in February, the band appeared on the popular BBC program Top of the Pops after David Bowie had to cancel. Yep, they were a last minute replacement. To promote Queen 2, the band went on their first ever headlining tour of the United Kingdom. In April, Man. they went on their first ever tour in the United States. However, in May, May, uh, Brian May, that is, in May, got really sick with hepatitis, and mm. Queen had to cancel the rest of their tour dates. The band decided to record some new material while May recovered. May had also developed a stomach ulcer and was so sick he couldn't even join them to record his guitar parts. So producer Roy Thomas Baker stepped in quite a bit. Finally, May was able to join the band in the studio, but apparently spent a lot of time in the bathroom between takes. Poor guy. Regardless, they eventually finished what would become a masterpiece, their third studio album, Sheer Heart Attack, released by EMI and Elektra on November 8th, 1974. The album was a hit both in the United Kingdom right. and United States, thanks okay. in large part to the lead single, Killer Queen. Sheer Heart Attack definitely had catchier and radio-ready songs, drifting away from the progressive rock of their first two albums. That said, by this album, Queen had developed a stunningly original sound. She's a killer. Highlighted by the musicianship of the four members, the more than three octave vocal range of Freddie Mercury, and the advanced and innovative production. Sheer Heart Attack also featured the hits Now I'm Here and Lily of the Valley. Oh, and the album song Stone Cold Crazy might have accidentally created speed metal. By January 1975, Queen was now in the mainstream and went on a world tour, returning to the United States as headliners this time. They sold out so much that they had to add more shows, sometimes mm. playing two shows in one day. The band dressed up in elaborate costumes, and the shows had all kinds of special effects. In April, Queen arrived in Japan with more than 3,000 adoring fans there to greet them. Throughout wow. the year, the band tried to get out of their contract with Trident Studios, which was kind of screwing them over since they didn't see much money at all from the first three albums. They finally split with Trident and September and got a new manager named John Reed, who also happened to be Elton John's manager. Meanwhile, mm. they had been recording at various studios what would become their fourth studio album, A Night at the Opera, named after the classic film. Supposedly, it was the most expensive album ever recorded at the time of its release, around $425,000 in today's money. They multi-tracked the heck out of it, and especially layered harmonies on top of each other in a way not done in recordings ever before with May. Hold on, let me make sure I heard that right. Four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Hold on, y'all. A Night at the Opera, named after the classic film. Supposedly, it was the most expensive album ever recorded at the time of its release, okay. around $425,000 in today's money. They multi-tracked okay. the heck out of it, okay. and especially layered harmonies on top of each other in a way not done in recordings ever before, with May singing lower parts, Taylor singing higher parts, and Mercury, everything else. They used a wide variety variety of instruments and explored a wide variety of styles. The songs were complex, yet still immediately catchy. The most epic of epic songs recorded for the album was Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. If you've never heard this song before for crying out loud, go listen to it right now. It's only six minutes. Just come right back. Welcome back. Uh, yeah, like I said, the song was nearly six minutes long, which is why the record label executives and friends of the band were all like, that's too long of a song. It will never be a hit. The band disagreed, and Mercury snuck a copy of the song to his friend, a popular DJ named Kenny Everett, only if he promised not to play it. Wink, wink. Oh, Everett played it all right 14 times in two days, and everybody loved it. And it Dang. ended up being one of their 
their biggest hits, ultimately becoming the UK's third highest single of all time. Queen even made a music video for it, which bands typically didn't do back then. Keep in mind that this was seven years before MTV existed. EMI and Elektra wow. released A Night at the Opera on November 21st, 1975. By Christmas, Bohemian Rhapsody was at the top of the UK singles chart and stayed there for nine weeks. Another standout hit from A Night at the Opera was You're My Best Friend. Queen went on another world tour to support the album and by now were one of the biggest bands in the world. On September 18th, 1976, the band played a free concert at Hyde Park, which drew a crowd of over 150,000. It was organized by Ooh. Richard Branson. Yes, that Richard Man, Branson. Meanwhile, Queen had also been recording what would become their fifth studio album, A Day at the Races, named after another Marx Brothers film. It was the first album in which they completely produced it themselves. Released again by EMI and Elektra on December 10th, 1976, A Day at the Races was another smash hit. It featured the singles Somebody to Love, Tie Your Mother Down, Good Old Fashioned Lover Boy, and Long Away. Critics generally praised it, and today it's on many greatest albums of all time lists. Queen toured to support the album for the first half of 1977. This was the tour in which the crowd began to often just take over singing all of their songs, and was the inspiration for two new songs which would make their next album. Those two songs? We Will Rock You and We Are The Champions. We are Today, the two it. songs, which of course are usually played back to back since they were released together and radio DJs just start playing them that way, are known for being two of the most famous songs of all time. They are especially known as sports anthems. EMI and Elektra released the band's sixth studio album, News of the World, on October 28th, 1977. Other than We Are the Champions and We Will Rock You, the album featured the singles Spread Your Wings and It's Late. This album saw the band abandoning their symphonic rock sound a bit and returning more to their hard rock roots. Okay. Yeah, 1977 was an interesting year in music. That's the year when punk rock exploded around the world, and many music fans were turning against progressive rock bands like Queen, who was a seemingly Ooh. easy target since they had such popular appeal. This might be why critics at the time were generally not as excited about News of the World. However, today many argue it's one of the best Queen albums. The band once again went on a worldwide tour to support the album. Dang, so people really uh, turned on Queen and a lot of more bands for punk rock? Bro, I'm telling you, you learn a lot. Of, like, I'm learning a lot of stuff right now about this. That's crazy that people turned on them for punk rock. Wow. By this tour, their shows were more spectacular than ever before, with amazing special effects and crazy costume changes. From July to October 1978, they recorded their seventh studio album, Jazz. Jazz had a more lighthearted feel to it, and featured three of their most well-known songs today, Bicycle Race, Fat Bottomed Girls, and Don't Stop Me Now. However, when it was released by EMI and Elektra on November 10th, 19. 1978, many critics trashed it. One famous critique came from Dave Marsh of Rolling Stone magazine, who wrote that Queen had become too elitist, saying, quote, This group has come to make it clear exactly who is superior and who is inferior. Its anthem, We Will Rock You, is a marching order. You will not rock us, we will rock you. Indeed, Queen may be the first truly fascist rock band, unquote. Other Journalists criticized the publicity stunt of staging a nude female bicycle race to promote the album. But it wasn't just critics. Band members Roger Taylor and John Deacon both expressed they didn't like how jazz turned out. That didn't matter. They were probably at the height of their popularity, selling out shows as they continued to tour around the world. On June 22nd, 1979, EMI and Elektra released Queen's first live album, Live Killers, recorded from the European portion of their Jazz World Tour. On October 5th, they released a single for the song Crazy Little Thing Called Love. 
Freddie Mercury made the song as a tribute to Elvis Presley and completed it in less than 10 minutes. It's wow. basically a rockabilly song and sounded nothing like anything Queen had created before. Strangely, the song ended up being the band's first number one single on the Billboard Hot 100 in the United States. Meanwhile, oh, the band man, was continuing right. to experiment in the studio. They began using synthesizers. Hey, just in time for the 80s. All this experimentation led to their most diverse album to date. Their eighth studio album, The Game, released by EMI and Elektra on June 30th, 1980. In addition to Crazy Little Thing Called Love, the album featured the singles Save Me, Play the Game, and Another One Bites the Dust, which features one of the best ba- Them are some of my favorite songs by Queen, especially Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and Bohemian Rhapsody is my all-time favorite by Queen, bro. Y'all let me know down below, what is y'all favorite song by Queen? Let me know down below. Bass lines in music history, the game was both a critical and commercial success. In okay. fact, it went on to become their best selling studio album in the United States. Another One Bites the Dust eventually became the band's biggest selling single, and it even became a crossover hit, getting as high as number two on both the Hot Soul Singles chart and the Disco Top 100 chart. Disco? Yes, disco. In September 1980, Queen performed three sold out shows at Madison. And Square Garden in New York City. Meanwhile, the band had recorded their first soundtrack for the space opera film Flash Gordon, featuring the single Flash. EMI released the Flash Gordon soundtrack on December 8th, 1980, and Electra released it in the States the following February. It was their ninth studio album. In 1981, Queen toured South America for the first time. In fact, they became the first big rock band to play in Latin American stadiums. Wow. They played a 131,000 and 120,000 on two consecutive nights in Sao Paulo. They played to a crowd of more than 300,000 in Buenos Aires. On April 6, 1981, EMI and Electra released Roger Taylor's debut solo album, Fun in Space. While Queen toured throughout most of 1981, they did return to the studio in the fall, specifically Mountain Studios in the small town of Montreux, Switzerland, one of their favorite studios over the years. Well, mm -hmm. guess who showed up one day? David freaking Bowie. In October, a Queen jam session featuring Bowie led to the creation of Under Pressure, which today is considered one of both Queen's best songs ever and David Bowie's best songs ever. They quickly Man. recorded and released it on October 26th, 1981. It immediately was a worldwide hit. That same day, EMI and Elektra released Queen's first compilation album, Album, greatest, hits, greatest Hits, which featured uh, their greatest hits up to that point. Now, this is not your typical Greatest Hits album. It eventually became the best-selling album, not just Greatest Hits album, but album, period, in the UK. Queen's Greatest Hits album has basically Why? been on and off the charts my entire life. It has spent over 900 weeks on the UK album's Ooh. chart, which is a record, by the way, and 400... Yes, that is a record. It spent 900 weeks, not one week, not two, 900 weeks on the UK album chart and 400 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart? Come on. <laughs> Come on. 100 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart. Go ahead and check your parents' or grandparents' record collection. It's there, isn't it? In 1982, Queen decided to stick with synthesizers and disco, recording their 10th studio album, Hot Space. Released by EMI and Elektra on May 21st, Hot Space marked a big shift in direction from the band's earlier music, not only embracing disco, but also going all in with funk, R&B, and even dance. What is rough, um we're gonna do a few songs in the uh, funk black category, whatever you call it. That doesn't mean we've lost our rock and roll feel, okay? I mean, I mean it's only a bloody record. People get so excited about these things. I mean, uh, so, um, yeah, this <laughs> shift scared some fans away. Those who only adored their more familiar rock sound did not dig Hot Space. Still, millions bought the album, and the radio played the heck out of it, especially there the singles go. Body Language and Staying Power. Hot Space had Under Pressure on it, too. Oh, and Michael Jackson, who by this time was friends with the band, later cited Hot Space as a big influence for 
for his own album, Thriller. You've heard of that one, haven't you? Yeah. For most of the rest of 1982, <laughs> Queen toured to support their album. On September 25th, they performed on Saturday Night Live, their only performance on the show. However, by that point, their popularity had clearly declined in the United States. And over the next few years, they would focus on touring elsewhere. In 1983, however, they took a break from touring altogether. Freddie began to record a solo album, and Roger began to record a second solo album. In April, Brian began recording, joined in the studio by folks like Edward Van Halen, Alan Gratzer, Phil Chen, and Fred Mandel. The result... It always seems to be the case like when groups be together, or something start happening where the group is falling apart or they ain't really getting the support they used to. It seemed like everybody start to go solo then. It seemed like that's always the case. It was the same case with the Beatles. It's like everybody eventually going to go solo. Man. Which is not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. You know, if you want to go solo, go solo. Because sometimes solo music uh, sound good by a lot of these artists that be in groups. Sometimes they want to show off what they can do without having to be surrounded by a group. Both of these recordings would end up being the Star Fleet Project, which Brian released on October 31st, 1983. By that time, the band had reunited to record what would become their 11th studio album, The Works, released by EMI and, oh, this time, Capitol Records, on February 27th, 1984. The Works saw the band bringing back at least some of their more guitar-based rock sound, yet still incorporating an electronic sound. The Works Works featured the singles Radio Gaga, It's a Hard Life, Hammer to Fall, and I Want to Break Free. The music video for I Want to Break Free, which features the band dressed in drag, was controversial in the United States. MTV even banned it. Goodness, oh, MTV, man. I thought you used to be cool. Anyway, on June 25th, 1984, EMI, Capitol, and Parlophone Records released Roger Taylor's second solo album, Strange Frontier. Two months later, the band went on tour to support the works, and it was the first to feature Spike Edney on keyboards. On April 29th, 1985, Freddie Mercury finally released his solo album, Mr. Bad Guy, with the help of Columbia Records. 1985 was the year for gigantic shows for Queen. In January, the band headlined two nights of the first Rock and Rio Festival in Rio de Janeiro. They played to 300 100,000 fans each Woo. night. A and then, people. the biggest and most famous Queen performance of all time. Bro, look at all them people, bro. Wow. I think I remember On July 13th, 1985, the band performed to one of the biggest television audiences in history, an estimated 1.9 billion people, 72,000 of them in person, saw Queen give a mesmerizing performance of their greatest hits at Live Aid, a huge benefit concert to raise money for those affected by the Ethiopian famine. Wow. Queen was the highlight of Live Aid. Freddie's call and response, Ayo! Segment later was called, quote, the note heard round the world. Today, it's regarded as one of the greatest rock performances of all time. The Live Aid performance re-energized the band, and they headed back to the studio in September. Over the next few months, they would record what would become their 12th studio album, A Kind of Magic. Meanwhile, John Deacon started a band called The Immortals that recorded one song and then broke up. I guess they weren't immortal after all. EMI and Capital released A Kind of Magic on June 2nd, 1986. Much of the album is part of the soundtrack to the film Highlander. Singles on A Kind of Magic included the title track and One Vision. The album was a commercial hit, but received mixed reviews from critics. The tour to support the album, which was another huge success, would sadly be Freddie Mercury's final tour with the band. In April 1987, Mercury found out he had HIV, a horrible
horrible virus that attacks the immune system and leads to AIDS. At the time, having AIDS meant you usually didn't have very long to live, since doctors were still trying to figure out how to treat it. After Freddie told his bandmates about it, the band agreed to no longer tour. The general public would not know about Freddie's AIDS diagnosis until right before he died. For the rest of the year, the band pursued various solo projects. Freddie recorded with the opera singer Mo Serrat Cabellier. Roger Taylor started a band called The Cross. In January 1988, Queen returned to the studio and spent the next year recording what would become their 13th studio album, The Miracle. Coming out on May 22nd, 1989, it featured the singles I Want It All, Breakthrough, and Scandal. It was the first album released in the United Kingdom by Parlophone Records, and Capitol released it again in the United States. Critics were again mixed about The Miracle, but it was another commercial success. By 1990, the public seemed to know something was up with the band. The band had made fewer and fewer public appearances. When they did appear, Freddie seemed to be weak and sickly. However, Freddie insisted it was just because he was, quote, exhausted. In November 1990, Queen ended their contract with Capitol and signed a huge North American recording deal with Hollywood Records. Mm. Hollywood caught the band up to modern times and got their entire catalog on CD. Meanwhile, Queen had been recording new stuff all year long. This would be their last time recording with Freddie, whose health had been deteriorating. And yet, one song they recorded during this time was one of their masterpieces that most people don't know about. The epic Innuendo, which I would argue rivals almost anything they ever recorded. This would be the title track for their 14th studio album, released by Parlophone and Hollywood Records on February 4th, 1991. In addition to the title track, Innuendo featured the singles Headlong, These Are the Days of Our Lives, and The Show Must Go On. Oh, and don't forget, I'm going slightly mad with Freddy and his bananas. Critics mostly praised Innuendo, and fans adored it. It was the band's most successful album in the United States since the works. The music video for These Are the Days of Our Lives would be the last time Freddy appeared on camera. On October 28th, EMI, Parlophone, and Hollywood Records released Greatest Hits 2, which also ended up being one of the most successful Greatest Hits albums of all time. On November 23rd, 1991, Freddie Mercury confirmed to the world that he had AIDS. Within 24 hours of releasing that statement, he had died from bronchial pneumonia, brought on as a complication of AIDS. While the world mourned Freddie's death, Queen's popularity seemed to rise again. The band had 10 albums on the UK Top 100 chart. On April 20th, 1992, the remaining members played the Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert for AIDS Awareness, a benefit for the Mercury Phoenix Trust, which raised money for AIDS research. Various rock singers sang Freddie's parts, and the show was brought cast around the world to an audience of around 1.2 billion. I think we'll go with a little Bohemian Rhapsody, gentlemen. Good call. That same year, Bohemian Rhapsody went to the top of the charts in North America after the song was featured prominently in the film Wayne's World. Meanwhile, Brian, Roger, and John had come across vocal and piano parts Freddie had recorded before his death. They added their own instrumentation and ended up turning that into an album. That would be Made in Heaven, Queen's 15th and final studio album released by Parlophone and Hollywood Records on November 6th, 1995. It included the singles Heaven for Everyone, A Winter's Tale, and Too Much Love Will Kill You. The album kind of did feel like heaven. It was so happy and carefree, critics generally praised it, and it proved that up until the day he died, even if his body was deteriorating, his voice and songwriting skills remained incredibly strong. In the following years, there were many, many compilation albums, the occasional reunion, lots of side projects and collaborations, and even a few solo albums from Brian May and Roger Taylor. In 2001, Queen was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In 2000. In 2004, the band was inducted into the UK Music Hall of Fame. Later that year, Brian and Roger announced that Queen would reunite for a world tour the next year with Paul Rogers, who founded the band's Free and Bad Company, as the singer. Paul Rogers is like one of my favorite singers from Bad Company. That man can sing. Wow. You, man, I love me some Paul Rogers.
singer. Freddie had loved Paul as a singer, by the way. John Deacon would not be involved with the project as he had retired from music by this time. But Spike Edney would. Heck yeah, Spike. Queen plus Paul Rogers would be a thing over the next four and a half years. Even recording an album together, The Cosmos Rocks, released on September 15th, 2008. Paul and Brian and Roger split ways in 2009. That year, Brian and Roger began working with the popular show American Idol and developed a liking for singer Adam Lambert. The three hit it off, and Queen plus Adam Lambert have been a thing ever since. They've played hundreds of shows around the world, and when they couldn't play in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, they recorded a song called You Are the Champions, and it was a minor hit. Today, Queen is just as relevant as ever before. They remain one of the biggest and influential rock bands of all time. Some estimate that the band has sold around 200 million records, which is just insane. Their musicianship is mostly unrivaled. They further helped progressive rock, hard rock, and heavy metal enter the mainstream, and over the years, developed a completely distinct sound all their own. They constantly pushed the envelope, yet still constantly had broad appeal. There will never be another queen, and queen will never die. Long live queen. So what's your favorite? Wow, bro. This was just incredible. This right here was incredible, man. Like I said, I'm starting to learn a lot st uh, a lot of more stuff about these groups, just like I did when I uh, checked out the brief history of the Beatles, and I had checked out the brief history of Queen. I'm just starting to learn a lot, man. As you can see, they was one of the biggest groups. And it was just crazy that people start watching them just to listen to punk rock. Like I said, that was something I didn't know about. But man, like, and you know, like when they come to Queen, I still listen to a lot of their songs. Like I said, Bohemian Rhapsody is still like my number one favorite song from Queen ever. Then you got the We Will Rock You. I can go on and on about Queen about my favorite song from because I got a lot of them. You know what I'm saying? But uh, like I said, y'all let me know down below what y'all think about it in the video. Do y'all think this guy left out information that should have been said? If so, let me know down below, all right? But uh, it's your boy Ado, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.